Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 26th Botsock webinar. Um, so happy for you uh, to join us this evening. Um, as usual, we will be having the three speakers, and uh, we take your questions and comments and where you're from in the chat. It would be great um, to, to just log in and tell us where you where what you're doing. If you have any questions, there are the um, Q&A section at the bottom. And um, yeah, let's get to it. Uh, so I'm Rupert Koopman presenting this uh, webinar series on behalf of the Botanical Society of South Africa. And uh, today we are going to talk about our gardens. Um, you know, uh, what to do. It's cooler outside. Certainly down in the Cape, we've been out in the field and um, there are lots and lots of um, of of geophytes that have been out, especially the Amaryllidaceae. Um, and as such, we've definitely uh, been blessed with a great start to the field season. Right. So um, I had the best time in, in uh, the Overberg in the last couple of days, and I'm glad to see that there are people from the Overberg, specifically our first speaker. So um, Jeff Nichols is uh, originally from KwaZulu-Natal, uh, a very well-known horticulturalist. Uh, we will link to some of his publications um, in the webinar notes afterwards, but um, suffice to say that he is a, um, a real plant force and these days down in the Southern Cape. And uh, I was happy, uh, lucky to join him in field um, two days ago in Yellum. And uh, Jeff, could you please um, put on your camera and your microphone and share your screen, please? Yeah, just um, unmute yourself. <laughs> okay i think i've unmuted yeah no yeah you yeah. clearly and see everything clearly so please right. go ahead thank you very much thank you good evening everyone and been very nice to be in the field with rupert as well teaches us all sorts of funny things okay this is uh, gentle gardening and I lived in a place called Southport down the Natal South Coast for about 10 years. I grew up down there, but worked in Durban for a long time. But came down there in a while, and everything you see in the yellow um, oblong squiggly lines is where we lived. And... In that garden, I had over 700 species of plants, some very big trees, mostly local, but a lot of fruit trees. We had about 15 avo trees that produced quite a lot of avocados for us every year. <clears throat> anyway, so we're looking at this sort of idea of gentle gardening and in early autumn or autumn and during winter, especially on the on the tropical subtropical coast of KZN and parts of the Eastern Cape, you end up having to do a bit of pruning when things have flowered. And there are a lot of leonotus and funny shrubs that produce quite a lot of flowers this time of the year as as the season, as the day length gets less, these things come into flower. But once they finish flowering and set their seed, you prune them back. And the sort of rule of thumb and all this pruning is, is going back about a third of the length of the, of the stem that you want to prune back. And with some of the trees in my garden, I used to just lift them a bit to allow more light in underneath because you need the layers. And you'll see a bit more of that in a, in a while. And the, this is really what I was trying to do, and I still do. I've started to do it in my new garden down at um, near Cape Agullis. and it's there's not a tree in sight there. It's all all the vegetation where I live is Strunfelt, and the tallest thing is a is a, a beetle or chrysanthemoides, which is now an osteosperm. But anyway, it's 
that's about my biggest tree and gets up to about three meters and has a wonderful trunk. But they're all coming into flower now. But what you're trying to do is to create a house and the life requisites for all of us, doesn't matter whether you're a human, an insect, a little protozoa, and anything you like. It's feeding, breeding, nesting, resting. And that's a, it's four words that Ben Breedlove, a friend of mine, has dreamt up many years ago. And you have to do those four things if you want to pass your genetic material onwards. And it's called a habitat, and it doesn't matter who you are, really. A canopy is the top layer of plants, whether they're a meter high or 40 meters high in a, in a tropical jungle. Then you have these sort of sub-canopy areas. Creepers are the ladders. If you're a mouse or a lizard or something, you want to get up into that canopy and you can't fly, well, there is your cable car all the way up. And then the sort of mid-canopy, you can call it an understory if you like. It varies depending on the vegetation type. And then you have a ground cover layer, which is all the funny little things that grow in not much more than a meter high in some places. But down here with us, some of them are only about five to ten centimeters high because of the wind. And also they just they get a lot of drought in the summertime. So they need to save their resources. Creepers were always or are still always my favorites in a garden. They tend not to be for gardens that want to be neat and tidy. My gardens have all, always been a bit far left, if you like, or even far right. It doesn't matter which side of the spectrum it is, but I'm told I'm extreme. And I like all those bushy things. And creepers act as shrouds and wind protection. And I'm, I'm already doing it here with odd creepers that work with us. But in KZN, these coccinias, that's um, coccinia, it's now Mackinac, it used to be Palmata. And the fruit is this lovely red thing that bitter is all hell to the humid palate, but birds and monkeys love them. And the flowers bring in lots of bleas. And they, cl they climb over um, the edges of forest on the, on the fringes of forest or a bush clump. And I used to allow them in my hedge in my garden. And this, the, it's a cucumber. And this, this plant here is a thing called Zaneria which is also a cucumber with tiny little marble-sized or half-marble-sized purple fruits when they're ripe. And those are quite palatable to a human. And it makes a good spinach. The green leaves of both of these make a good spinach. And then the bottom one is Carissa, not Carissa, Capris rather, Tomentosa. It's the biggest of the Capris and has these big round balls when they, of fruits that um, when they're ripe. Between the monkeys and the birds, they spread them all over the, the thing. And this tends to be a drier bush felt plant. It's on the edges of forest with us, but it's on the dry sides, dry slopes. And you, you end up, when you're trying to look after colour, well, here we, we've got a, a hemanthus, which is close to the scodoxus, but this is scodoxus punicius. That flowers in the last week of from the last week of July through to about mid-August and as you go inland it's a bit later in, in KZN but it's a lovely thing don't dig them up just leave them where they are where they come up and they're wonderful in pots and trays I tend to prefer these bulbs and trays their roots can spread out further and on the right is Xylothica crassiana it's a beautiful thing with the sunbird coming in just to have a look at the flowers. They don't do much. They, they might get a bit of thing, but they often come for insects and spiders' webs. This is the sort of habitat that was around us where we lived. And blue diker, I had a pair of breeding in my garden. And that that's a key thing, disturbance. Um, you don't want lots of disturbance. And if you provide ground cover and cover at the, the height of a a fox terrier type animal, this little blue diker will live quite happily and they can get away faster than any dog or cat that you may have as a pet. And the other birds are a uh, collared sunbird. Cavities. And I always liken it to original buyers and tenants. In other words, a multi-use home. We only have two sets of um, things that can 
close. Sorry, I've cut these the two woodpeckers out here. But woodpeckers and barbets in our part of the world are the only things that can make cavities and dead branches. They do the first set of breeding. There's the barbet hole there. And what happens is when they finish producing their young in the next season, and, and sometimes even in the current season, depending if the barbets don't use the home after they finish nesting as a roost, you get things like starlings and um, these gray-headed sparrows come and nest in these holes as well. So you get two lots of, of um, tenants, if you like, for the second breeding. And also the, the green um, the green wood hoopoo. Then you look at nest sites and things like swallows and um, kingfishers, the, the little pygmy kingfisher here on the left and the brown hooded kingfisher on the right, they like a vertical bank. And if there's any way in your garden you can create a bank, and it doesn't have to be higher than about a meter um, vertical face. And these Berea red sands on the coast, it's very easy to get these birds to come and nest with you. And the other thing is to have, instead of having a paved driveway, have a muddy driveway or a pothole in the driveway where mud and water can gather at the bottom and the swallows will come in and pick up the, um, the pellets of mud and cart them off to create their homes up at the top. This is a, a um, what's it, a wire-tailed swallow. And this one here is a, is a lesser striped swallow. Down here we have the greater swipe, striped swallow doing the same thing and lots of rock martins nesting on the buildings in the village. And because our village only has dirt roads in the middle, um, when it's raining now from about April, May through till probably October, September, October, the, these swallows will, will breed and that's what you need. And here we go again, a sort of a recap of things of ledges, cavities, water and feeders. Now, some people frown at feeding birds or if you feed birds, they, they frown at you and they're not very happy that you do that. But in suburbia, it's often the only piece of reliable food. When I see what goes for development in this part of the world, the first thing that happens is a payloader comes in and clears a plot, literally, and it's just bare sand um, from boundary to boundary and up to the road. And then it spend millions trying to put all the plants back instead of just only clearing what you need to for the house. But in these cavity walls, these shale walls and any, any rock wall, if you pack up things in a tight way that um, predators can't get at the, at the little um, lizards and stuff that go into them. And then putting out food, um, rotten local fruit tray here in the little store that near us, I get their rotten fruit and cut the apples up or the pears or bananas and stick it in the in a wire thing. In Durban, of course, you get all the monkeys, but with us, there's very few things that feed on it other than the birds. That's quite interesting. And the, and very few butterflies here, but up in the coast, you get all the caraxes coming to look for the, um, the sugars as the fruit rots and go, liquefies. Winter, but the aloes, this is a ubiquitous aloe arborescence. It's all over the country growing. It occurs naturally down, down to about, I forget where it is, it's near Riversdale that they, they're in the hills there. But it's, it's a common aloe. Use it. It's a beautiful thing. It's quite long flowering. And if you get different forms, locally there's about three forms, and you get about four or five weeks of flowering if you ask nicely to let somebody take another cutting or break off a piece and stick it in the ground, it grows well. Getting all the fruiting things up in KZN at the moment. This is a Scheffler, it's changed its name. Um, what's it? I think Neocasonia or something. I forget. I've always got to look it up. But anyway, somber baubles with us are common. And they love cycad, um, the flesh around the seed of a cycad. And this is a chrysanthemoides or nostia sperm beta, if you like. 
that the fruit down, down here ripens to a sort of a yellow raisin color, but in residue, the fruit ripens black, as you can see in the beak of this, of this um, bird. So winter food is an important thing, and um, Vito and both, both sides of the country produce lots of fruit, and it's for me, it's one of the best pioneers, and it creates a nice shelter for all sorts of things. Cycads, this is one of the endemic cycads up in northern Zululand along the coast. It's commonly grown, and it has these spectacular orange-red um, cones, and this was in my garden in near Port Chepstow in Southport. And there's 16 white eyes going for the, the soft flesh around the outside. Very nice cycad. Living on the coast, I was surprised as hell to find this allothraski growing down here in Cape Gullis and all the villages here. It's, it's a common aloe. But down here, the porcupines get hungry in summer and they start to eat this allothraski. So a friend of mine had a, one about the size that you see in the picture, completely chewed out by a porcupine overnight. And this osteo or dimorphica fruticosa, depends whether you want to call it osteospermum or not. This is common on the beaches, both here and in KZN. A very good dune pioneer um, for holding sand on sand dunes and stuff, but it's a very nice ground cover in a garden, um, but loves full sun. There's, there's an allothraski near where we used to live, and they look just as good down here, but really a bit incongruous because they don't occur naturally. They, they peter out just down the Transkei coast a bit. One of my favorite um, shrubby scramblers, if you like, is the crossberry Gruia occidentalis. Beautiful thing, and the fruit are actually quite tasty, even to humans. So, and they make wonderful hedges and screens, and they're quick growing. So, and you can prune them back. You can treat them a bit like a hedge if you if you catch them early enough. Don't don't prune them back when they've got a, a thick stem because then you lose the, the shelter part of it. Maitinus procumbens. Here are tallest Maitinus procumbens are about half a meter tall. And KZN, they used to go up to about three or four meters in the bush. But it's a good dune pioneer on coastal gardens, providing lots of um, flower for, for insects and pollen and nectar. And then the fruit uh, at the start of the year, April, May, is very good for the birds as well. And then a selection of coastal trees, um, the Sideroxylon inermi also occurs down in, in the Southern Cape. It's the main big tree in all the bush clumps, but with us tended to be less common. Mimisops cafra, the, the coast red milkwood, is a much um, more common plant in the dune bush around Durban, down the south coast. And this Euclea natalensis natal guari, beautiful thing as a street tree and you can see it's had a checkered career as a street tree they they take odd shapes when they get pruned up Lophilus natalensis apodites is common it's here in the forests as well and, and funnily enough bracolina discolor is often used as a hedge in the southern cape and western cape and it occurs naturally with in kzn and people always call it untidy but you can keep it in Keep it in, um, what's the word, in shape by giving it a regular pruning, and it works very well. And then this is some of the things. Look around you in the, create a calendar, and it's just a pie chart, really, but put the months around the edges, 12 months, and figs in the middle for me are the, the fig trees. There's a fig for every biome in this country. Use them because they provide food throughout the year, not only in, at one season, but they, depending on where you get your figs from, or where you get your plants from a nursery, or if you collect seed, that fruit, those trees can fruit at varying times in the year. So plant a whole lot of figs, but again, with figs, be careful for gardens with underground services and septic tanks and things like that. They'll block drains very quickly. So give them space. But what you do is look around your district or your neighborhood 
and see what's flowering. Make, make a note. It's like a birthday calendar. And then go looking. And if you can get a tree in every single month, or it doesn't have to be a tree. It could be a shrub. It could be down here. It could be an erica. It could be a protea. There's proteas flowering at different times of the year. Get a selection of proteas from your part of the world. And you end up having a lot of diversity. And that's the key to this whole thing. And these triangles here, these are sort of food triangles, but you've got canopy feeding swallows and swifts and stuff like that. They fly around in the air, but they, they need the trees and the vegetation below to provide the insects for them to be able to catch in the air. At the moment, the barn swallows have just left, but we've got pearl-breasted swallows in our village. There's a nesting pair in a cave up the hill here behind us. And this thing, they they've are flying around the, the roycrans or acacia um, cyclops that has a midge that's been used to as a biocontrol for this thing. And these swallows are flying over these trees every morning early, catching the midges that are coming off the trees. So it's a that's a secondary uh, use of, of biological control, feeding the local wildlife. And create your passageways through your neighborhood if you can. Get your neighbors to agree to leave a, your hedges a bit wilder. They become corridors and give a bit of shelter to the animals. And then just another couple of plants. This is Dianbolia, uh, Oblongifolia, the dune soapberry, feeding sombers and bulbuls. And here's a, a black flycatcher nest in an old rotten branch of a cassonia. And this, this uh, trumpeter hornbill was taken by Hugh Chittenden in a showing. And there's, there's a, a bullet hole through its cask. And it was probably a 0.22 or a pellet gun, but thank God it hit the cask and not the bird. Strelitzias, wonderful for the coast in Natal. Monkeys spread the seed. You can see their droppings in my garden used to have these orange arrows. This is the Strelitzia fruit. And they eat the arrow. It's really quite tasty, even to a human. And the sunbirds, of course, love the Strelitzia flowers. And Hugh, again, took these pictures for me. And this sunbird, the pollen is, is here, and it's sticky. It sticks to the, to the feet of the sunbird, and it flies off to the next flower. And the stigma is part of this section here. And what happens is the, the pollen gets transferred from flower to flower and from clump to clump, and eventually... Get a lot of seed, which then feeds the doves. The doves eat the arrows as well as the seed. But monkeys love the arrows. You can see monkeys are a thing of our garden. There's a dianbolia in all its glory. And it's one of the best butterfly feeding plants in the country. And it's a very nice tree for a small garden. This was in my garden in Durban. And this tree was only about 15 years old, which I planted when we first moved there. And it provided a lot of food for the neighborhood birds and, and monkeys. Canary creeper, Rupert was saying it's declared a, a noxious weed in parts of the world, but it, this thing is a lovely thing. And I let it grow over my head and it brought in all sorts. This is a clouded flat butterfly comes in for the nectar. And one of the best things for coastal um, gardens is this Perestrophe or now Dicliptera cernua buckwheat and it, these flowers are in, they come into flower now and they're very long flowering it's about six weeks and you can see the browse line of the bushbuck they they've browsed everything up to about 1.2 1.3 meters and the rest is in flower and that's that's a good thing and finally my favorite birds the trumpeter hornbills and that's it thanks jeff Thank <laughs> um, you should have a look in the chat there are a couple of of your oh, acquaintances okay. um from from the rest of of the country uh, uh, well, at least from okay. KZN so if you could also just stop sharing your side okay thank you very much cool okay uh Jeff also you can switch off your camera <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you can so you can relax now <laughs> oh good <laughs> I'll, I'll mute i'll mute too that'll keep me quiet too <laughs> thanks 
Yeah, so I, I think that's a, a really um, a good primer from, from Jeff because of the fact that it almost is not a people-centered view of gardening. So it's gardening, but for the other inhabitants that are around you. And uh, if you hadn't picked up, it was definitely aimed at people that are from the um, the summer rainfall coastal areas. So uh, that garden specifically is on the south coast of KwaZulu Natal. But I think those principles you could apply um, quite broadly. Right. Our um, next speaker, I've pre-recorded two of them because for various reasons. Um, so the next speaker is um, Ofense Nanyane, and she's a horticulturist at, from Sanbi at the um, Free State Botanical Garden. So she will be giving us a bit of an idea as to how you need to start um, going about gardening and looking at the kind of physical aspects, um, biophysical aspects of being up um, on, on the escarpment, essentially. So very different. So we're going from the, from the coast straight up to above a thousand meters and let's hear what the fence has to say. Good afternoon, everyone. Our presentation, I'll be doing a presentation on preparing your inland indigenous garden in autumn. Our inland highland region of South Africa normally comprises of five provinces, which are namely the Free State Province, Gauteng, Mpumalanga, Northwest, and the Limpopo. On the slide, you can see on the left, uh, you have, we have a map or a, graf a graphitic map, which indicates the biomes that we have in SA. Uh, the in inland high region also situated in the interior or the central region of the country. The topography normally of the inland would be flat and rolling. So mostly with the topography of the inland, most of the, the areas or the, the, the felt areas, it would be flat and the surface would be flat to almost rolling. Inland altitude, the inland altitude is approximately to 2,850 meters above sea level. The climate of the inland highlands, in, as, an indicate, as it indicates on the slides, the inland is a summer rainfall region. So the inland mostly receives its rainfall during the summer season. So in autumn, the autumn, season in the inlands is within the months during the months of March, April and May. The, the summer temperatures would range from you know, 32 to 8, 38 degrees Celsius. It's normally very warm and, and sunny in the inlands. The winter it would be cold and dry temperatures ranging below almost from 15 degrees going down to 10 and below 10 degrees degrees in winter. The inland highland region, within the inland high, highland region, we find one of the largest biomes, which, which is the grassland biome. Grassland biome is one of the biomes that occurs within the inland highland region of South Africa. So it is um, known as one of the second largest biome in South Africa. As I indicated earlier on in the slide, that the Inland comprises of five provinces, which were named earlier on. So in this uh, inland highland, we will be focusing also on the grassland biome since it's uh, the most uh, prevalent or the most dominant biome within the inland. So the topography also, as I indicated earlier on, it's flat and rolling. Central plateau of South Africa, the vegetation dominance of the grassland. Um, it is the grass and mostly within the, 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 the grassland, you would find in, do, in, 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 in dominance, you will find geophytes and a few trees. So most of the 
the vegetation that is found within the grassland biomes would be your geophytes and a few trees as the reason is most of the plants that are growing they will be dominate dominating and also the climatic conditions of the grassland uh, will not favor much of the the trees so it's the most commonly trees that we found we find in the grassland will be your curry trees and will be your casonias and and, and so on and now we will start with the we'll go through the geophile since i indicated that most of the vegetation that grows within the inland region it is the geophiles they are dominant and also they are able to survive during the fire bands or during the fire, uh, the winter season they go dormant most of them and on the slide you you will see that there's a hypoxis hemorrhagic day this species of uh, Mewelia plumbia, which is forced under the Amerilidaceae family, and we have the Croscomia, uh, which falls under the Iridaceae family. So most of uh, these geophytes are found in the grassland biome and are also found within the region of, of Free State. So on the screen you can on, on the slide you can see that we have we also have on on our, our right hand side uh, the seeds of the the hypoxis and also the, the diameters and in terms of um the, the hypoxis hypoxis can be propagated from from seeds um and then also it can be propagated from the offsets of the plant and it flowers during the summer season and it be, this is can be sown it, relatively in the autumn autumn season for flowering in around about spring to summer and you also have um, the mewila plumbia which falls under the hyacinthia uh, family um the mewila also can be propagated from the seeds and also from 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 the from the bulbs from the offs, offsets of of the bulbs and the seeds are sown in in spring and by separation you can you can separate the offsets the mother plant offsets in winter so uh, the seeds do not take much time to to germinate you can germinate within a period of four weeks or so then we have your your crop Crocosmia family, the family of the Iridaceae, which is one of the species also found within the, the the grassland, the grassland biomes, and the Crocosmia normally the bulbs will, or the combs will be lifted from the soil in autumn to prepare and also to store until spring. So propagation of the the seeds seeds can be sown in summer and then also it can be propagated from from comb offsets comb offsets from the from the the tips of the stolons in winter so they can be propagated from seeds corcosmia aurea can be propagated from seeds and also from the the offsets or the the comlets that uh, are produced from the mother mother root or mother plant uh, so on on also on the same slide on the right hand side of the slide you will see the uh, ripened crosscosmia aurea seeds that have ripened and then they are ready for 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 storage and also to be planted for for some for summer growing and also you'll see in the middle of the, the same image, we have the mewila bulbs. Mewila bulbs also can be planted during the almost end of winter season to encourage growth and flowering in the, in the summer, summer season. So the other 
genus or family that might be found within the grassland biome is the the, the, the mesems or the mesembryanthemacea. The family is Aoasia. Mostly the, the plants are commonly known as the Phaichi family. The Phaichi family is one of the largest um, family in the succulents of your mostly low growing and your thinner leaved um, succulent like plants, which um, they have the days like flowers. And also the 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 structure of of of, of the plants or the mesems is in, in a way that they are also able to store water in their leaves for a long period of time. So they are very easy. So on the slide you will see that we have the Lospema cuperi and the Lospema floribunda. So these are some of these are the some of the few that are more prevalent within the grassland biome so they are very easy to grow so within the the family or the genus of the mesems we have the mesems are very there's a vast um, number of plants or genera it consists of 127 genera and about 1700 species it has been researched that 63 percent of that of, of the succulent flora the the mesems makes 10 percent of south africa's flora so it is as indicated one of the large family within the the, the succulent category and it produces beautiful daisy like flowers and within the category we have your delospemas we have your clotifylum regium we have the, the drosanthemums and in terms of the Delosperma cuperi the, and the Delosperma floribunda, this is one, this is one of the species, Delosperma floribunda, that is more prevalent or that will be found in the Free State region. And also, it is very easy to grow in terms of propagation. This you saw the seeds in February too much, and then you can also make cuttings from the plant they are made during summer the warmer season and also the medium or the soil that should be used should be and should be well drained uh coarse river sand this is to ensure that the the, the plant does not rot because as I indicated earlier on succulents or mesems are uh, those kind of plants that are fleshy and also store water on their leaves for a very long period of time um, that, that is their physiology. And also uh, the Losperma, within the, the family of the, the Losperma we have, or the genera, we have almost 162 species in the in the central or in the inland, highland parts region of the country of South Africa. And then they are prone, they, they thrive in, in full sun, and they are also frost, frost hardy, especially the, 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 the Losperma, the Lospema floribundum, it is frost and drought hardy. So you can also grow it from seeds, the De Lospema floribundum, grow it from seeds in, in coarse sand, about two millimeters in, in depth, and you just cover with a fine layer of loam soil or fine soil, and then also ensure that you do not overwater the species since succulents do not love to be overwatered so that your plants will be able to thrive and your plants will be able to uh, survive for longer periods and you will be able to enjoy a pleasant garden so we, in terms of the seeds also you can you can sow the seeds in march a, or april or may the seeds will normally germinate um, within a period of seven to 14 days and then that that's when you'll be able to and your seedlings and also you'll be able to transplant the seedlings and you will be able to watch your plants yield and also enjoy the 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 yield of the of the the species so these are species that are very frost hardy and drought resistant as i said and they are very easy and also easy to 
maintain and easy to cultivate. So I've reached the end of my presentation. Thank you. Yeah, so um, Ofense was extremely nervous and um, she did great. I also asked her a follow-up question about frost. So let me play that too. I think that's an important um, criteria that those of us in the coastal regions don't actually have to think about. So just give me a second. Okay, for protecting your garden against frost during the winter season, as we know that Free State is one of the provinces within the inlands that gets very cold and the temperatures would drop to sometimes below one. So what you can do in your garden, in your back, backyard garden, you can ensure that uh, you check first for the materials that you have. Um, one of the very useful materials that you can have for your plants it would be the frost cover and also you can check in terms of your your mediums or your soils that um if you have your 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 mulching leaves your organic leaf leaves that are also helpful in terms of using the frost for species or genuses such as your clevia miniatus the frost uh, covers they come very handy during the winter season to protect them against the, the the frost and also other species like your clectrantas you can also cover them with the the frost cover so you can just gauge and just look uh, around your garden as to which plants are more susceptible to to frost in terms of 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 the winter in, in during the winter season and using the frost cover will be very helpful you can um it's readily available the frost cover you can check in any of the wholesale nurseries that are around you or nearby you it is easily found there and in terms of your your beddings where you have planted your geophytes the dormant ones and the ones that will probably flower during the springtime and the summertime just make sure that um you cover at least with a, a, a thicker layer of your your fallen leaves or or your mulch just um gather your mulch together or your leaves together in the backyard of your garden since it, it is ottoman the trees have started to shed their their leaves just make sure that you you have a sort of a, a bean a mulch bean where you gather your leaves and also just to spread on top of your beddings especially the ones with the geophytes your bulbs your gladioli your um, freeze yes whatever bulbs that you have in your in your backyard garden so that also comes in the hand in terms of protecting and also keeping the the the, the temperature so i think that will go a long way to helping those are just a few basic tips in terms of uh, protecting your garden against frost during the winter season thank you yeah so as you can see um she warmed up <laughs> and um, uh, definitely I want to get her back to talk a bit more about the free state gardens uh, later on. Okay, so um, remember to please put your your questions um, in the Q, in the Q&A box. Um, unfortunately, we only have Jeff online as, as a garden expert, but um, we'll see what we can do. And I also have a lot of faith in the assembled brains in the audience. Okay. So our next um, speaker, who's currently in Namibia doing field work, is Anneli Sienakal. She's the assistant curator at the Stellenbosch University Botanical Garden. So she's going to give us the skinny on how to prep your um, your Feinbos garden for autumn. Hello everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be here in person today, but while you're all listening to this pre-recorded talk, I'm most likely busy setting up camp somewhere in the south of Namibia. But let's bring this talk back to the Cape where everything is starting to come back to life in the felt and 
hopefully also in your indigenous Cape Garden. So to start off this talk, I'd like to just highlight the Cape climate because this will influence how you plan and maintain your Cape Garden in all seasons. When I talk about the Cape, I'm basically referring to the Cape Floristic region, which is more or less the section highlighted in this map. And um, this region is climatically separated from the rest of the country because it is the only part of South Africa that has a Mediterranean type climate. So even though the climate can be quite variable across the region, Generally speaking, it has moderately cool, wet winters and hot, dry summers. During summer, many plants um, go completely dormant and stop their active growth because um, this prevents desiccation and death during this harsh period. And also during summer, um, we often get fires. And because of this, many plants are adapted to only flower after a fire or for their seed to only germinate after a fire. Autumn specifically in the Cape is signaled by a um, drop in temperatures, a moderation of the southeaster, and of course the onset of the winter rains. And in the felt, many plants in the Amaryllidaceae family respond to these signals by um, flowering. And for many of us, the appearance of flowers uh, like that of Amaryllis belladonna and Brunswickias and Hemanthus is a sign that autumn has arrived. So perhaps a good place to start would be with um, geophytes. So in the Cape, the Cape is extremely rich in geophytes and geophytes are nice in a garden because um, you don't need a big garden to have geophytes. You can just have a balcony and you can plant them in pots. And just to be clear, geophytes are plants that have underground storage organs like, organs like um, bulbs, corms, tubers and rhizomes. Um, so, yeah, and the nice thing about Cape geophytes is that different groups of them flower at different times of the year. So if you plan your garden nicely, you can pretty much always have a geophyte flowering in your garden. So the first group, um, of course, are the Amaryllidaceae, as I just mentioned, and they flower in autumn, and some of them will probably already be setting seed by now. So they shouldn't be planted or transplanted at this time of the year, but if you remember to plant them in summer, they should be bringing some color to your garden in autumn. The next group of plants that I'd like to mention is the Cape Oxalis. So in South Africa, we often think of them as weeds, but in fact, Oxalis, uh, the Oxalis genus is the largest geophytic genus in the Greater Cape Floristic region, and the variety of flower colors and patterns and leaf shapes and sizes available is just astonishing. They're also very forgiving uh, to grow, and with the exception of a few habitat specialist species, they're so easy to grow that you can almost completely forget about them once you've planted them in the ground. So unfortunately, right now is also a little bit too late to place um, oxalis in the ground because they start growing just after the first rains. But if you plant them in the ground by about February, they will flower throughout the entire autumn and winter season, and they'll only start dying down once the spring flowering geophytes make their appearance. So this brings me then to the spring flowering geophytes. And right now really is a perfect time to get them into the ground. Some of them might already started growing a little bit by now, but you can still get away with moving and transplanting them if necessary. So um, in the Cape, we have a large number of spring and summer flowering geophytes, including uh, many gladioli, moreas, bobianas, freesias, um, and the list just goes on. So when planting geophytes, there are a few general rules of thumb that you can follow. With most geophytes, you can place them about two to three centimeters the length of the, of the geophyte under the soil surface. So for example, if you're planting a one centimeter lacanalia bulb, um, one centimeter in length, you can place it about three centimeters below the soil surface. The exception to this rule are the Amaryllidaceae that have bulb necks. Those necks should always be exposed above ground with the rest of the bulb below the soil surface. Another general rule of thumb that you can use for Cape geophytes is to plant them in a relatively well-drained soil. So if you're unsure of a, me a medium to use for a Cape geophyte in your garden, just make sure that it is quite well-drained. And generally speaking, it doesn't have to be very rich in organic material either. So 
Once you've planted them in the ground, um, you can place them in full sun, give them a nice drench, and then once they start pushing out leaves above the soil, you can water them regularly throughout the whole autumn, um, winter, and spring season until they start showing signs of dieback, and then give them a period of rest over summer and don't water them at all in that time. So autumn is also a great time to sow most Cape seeds. And when sowing seeds, it is helpful to understand a little bit about the seed biology of the plant that you're trying to propagate. So as I mentioned earlier, um, many plants in the in the Cape is uh, are adapted to only smoke in response in response to um, smoke stimulation. So um, they will benefit from smoke treatment. And you can buy smoke treatment at any of your local indigenous nurseries, or if you want to try a more DIY method, you can burn some dry leaves and grass or newspaper, and you can just gently blow the smoke over the seeds for at least 10 minutes at a time. Um, in my experience, most Cape seeds respond positively to smoke treatment. So if you um, have, even if they don't exclusively need smoke treatment to germinate. So if you've been struggling to germinate certain Cape seeds or um, yeah, you've just been getting a low germination rate for certain things, you can give smoke treatment a go and maybe it will improve your success rate. So um, in the Cape, we also have a few groups that mainly have recalcitrant seeds and recalcitrant seeds are those that don't have a dormancy period and they germinate quite soon after they were sown. So these seeds can't dry out, and because of this, they can't be stored like most seeds that most of us are used to. Um, they tend to be quite fleshy. Um, for example, in the Cape, uh, many of the amaryllids have recalcitrant seeds like the Hemanthus. And the reason why this happens is because many of them flower in autumn, it's right at the start of the rainy season. So they're pretty much guaranteed moisture, um, that moisture would be available for germination. Another group in the Cape of which the majority have recalcitrant seeds are the Cape oxalis. So again, the reason why they have recalcitrant seeds is because they flower right in the middle of the rainy season. And again, they are guaranteed moisture for germination. So in this picture, you can see a recalcitrant oxalis seed, and it doesn't really look like a normal seed. Um, it's actually just two little um, cotyledons and a radical ready to start growing. So when sowing recalcitrant seeds, you can make a small depression in the soil and just place the seed on in, in that depression. You don't need to cover the seed with soil. With, yeah, with soil. Um, and you can immediately water it and just make sure you keep those seeds moist, um, never letting them dry out. And then once they start growing, of course, just keep watering them. And if it's a geophyte like your um, amaryllis or axalis, then just stop watering them once they start dying back in spring or summer. So of course, sowing seeds is a long-term investment and unless you're sowing annuals, most of these plants won't flower in the first season after sowing. Oxalis can sometimes flower in the second year already, but most geophytes will take at least three years to flower. Many of the Amaryllidaceae will take even longer. And of course, when we're talking about shrubs and trees, they'll take quite a few years until they mature enough to flower. But the nice thing about sowing seeds is that it is quite a, an effective way to get a lot of one thing in your garden. So if you're just a little bit patient, it will pay off. So our spring flowering annuals can also be sown right now. Annuals are plants that flower and produce seed in the same season and then die in that same season. Um, in the Cape, we have many annuals to choose from, including Nemesias, Heliophilus, and many species in the daisy family. Um, so in sowing annuals, you can sow them directly into your garden bed and just cover them with a fine, uh, fine layer of soil. Just make sure you don't sow on a windy day because the seeds might blow away. And just an interesting little side note about Cape annuals is that we have quite a lot of blue flowering annuals available and the gardeners among us will know that blue is quite a difficult color to find for, for your garden. So um, we're quite lucky in this regard. Um, just think of all the Heliophilus, Lobelias, and Felicias that we have. So autumn is also a good time to make cuttings of succulents um, just before they start growing actively. I know making cuttings of succulents is old news for most of us, but I'll just run over the process quickly anyway. 
So cuttings are, of course, the easiest and quickest way that you can propagate succulents. And you can basically just cut about a 10 centimeter piece of, of the stem of the succulent off. And then generally speaking, you would let it dry out for a day or two. Um, and this is just to help prevent rot of that cutting. And then after you've let it dry out, you can place it in a well-drained soil. Um, you can water it, but don't overwater that cutting until it has um, set roots. So um, if you're unsure, you can almost let that medium dry out completely before you give it the next water. And then as soon as it has produced roots and um, shoots, you can start watering it a little bit more regularly, especially, especially during the growing season. So the last group of plants that I'd just quickly like to mention are shrubs. So your cape shrubs um, can be transplanted and moved and divided in autumn. Um, but right now would not be a great time to prune them, for example, uh, generally speaking, because many of them will be forming flowers right now for springtime. So if you prune them, you might just cut off all those branches that will flower for you in spring. And um, similarly, you can leave any cuttings of your shrubs, so any hardwood and semi-hardwood cuttings until springtime because your success rate will just be a little bit higher in that time of the year. So I would like, I know that um, when we walk in the felt, it can be quite tempting to uh, take a cutting here and there or pocket a couple seeds. Um, but I would like to just ask everyone to please never do this without a permit. If you're struggling to find a specific plant that you're looking for, or um, if you can't find a local indigenous nursery close to you, um, rather contact your local Botswana branch for some help or go and visit one of your closest national botanical gardens, or you can come and see us at the Stellenbosch University Botanical Garden, and hopefully somebody will be able to help you. So good luck to everyone and happy gardening. Thanks so much, Henri. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it is a really uh, uh, well explained um, setup and you should be good to go. Uh, I don't see many questions in the Q&A, um, but I do want to um, read out one which has been there. Uh, so Penelope Brown was asking how many people roughly are using these locally indigenous plants in their gardens these days. And Jeff replied in text from his experience, about 20 to 30% of gardeners are using locally indigenous plants in their garden. Much of the issue is that it's fairly difficult to buy these locally indigenous plants from commercial nurseries. And I think that is a good kind of um, opportunity for the various Botsock branches. I know definitely KZN um, Inland in Peter Maritzburg are working with uh, the National Botanical Garden up there to um, do propagation. But um, yeah, it's a nice challenge for the branches to get some um, common locally indigenous plants going um, and so that, that we can uh, get them into the gardens of our members. That's a great idea. Okay, I'm checking to see. Um, Jeff, do you want to put on your, your camera and and um, answer that question in the in the chat there? I'll read it out. Um, so that's Anthony Walton says, Jeff, I'm looking to collect seeds from some helichrysums in Moy River KZN in the next week or so. The plants are at risk in this particular locality due to poorly managed grazing and fire. And I'd like to grow some seed in case the population starts withering. Can you give any tips on when and how to sow the seeds and any sites or materials that I can use as reference maybe? Okay, um, a bit like Anneli was saying, the best time for, for the summer rainfall places, especially up in Not Nottingham Road where you're getting frost and stuff, is the plants, the helichrysum should be in seed now, at the end of, end of summer, early autumn and collect that seed, keep it till spring, till early September or till your, your last frost. And that varies now. I'm not sure what, what the dates are anymore. Hmm. And what you do with that is do as Annelie says, use smoke. And what I did in, down here was I turned my bucky into a smoke, smoking thing. You, you get a metal um, sieve 
when you put it on bricks in your thing with the metal underneath so you don't burn your rubber seal and you set the you set some grass and bits of pieces of vegetation from the local vegetation there with you your grasslands are perfect put in some and let it let it smolder and then close the canopy and boy you get a lot of smoke and in there you actually sow your seeds in the tray and then before you do the smoking and let that smoke and then every few minutes put a fine spray of from your hose pipe into the canopy of your of your bucket it's a bit unconventional but it works very nicely and you, you just don't give anybody a lift because they die from the smoke smell but the the mm -hmm. the the chemicals in that smoke help those plants to germinate and it really does work well. Cool, thank you. And Anthony, I think as far as reference sites, it'd be a good idea to contact your local branch there um, or someone like Isabel Johnson to to let you know about where good reference sites are. Um, uh, depending on the species that you're yeah. looking for. Yeah. And then um, I, there's a comment which says a lot of the the botanical gardens nurseries don't grow local western cape pl plants um because they go for in indigenous generic i guess and i think this is this is a, a chicken and egg situation you know so people yeah. won't grow a lot of plants unless there's demand for it so um i i know this sounds facetious but instead of sending the message here just make a little note and and pass it to your local nursery and say you would like more um, locally indigenous plants and then that will um, force them to start thinking about it and ultimately uh, you know a lot of the nurseries will will struggle to do the more specialist stuff and um, we're going to have to figure out a different way of doing it so keep an eye out on your local um, pot sock branch or people who are doing restoration and that sort of thing and that's that would be a start to start getting material Okay, so um, I don't see any other questions. And I think everyone's presentations were so good that you can just go and look at it again if you've got questions. Um, Jeff, if you don't mind dropping your camera. Right, so. I, I, no worries. I just want to do a, a, a couple of ad breaks on behalf of the bot sock. Um, so let me just sort this out. Um, okay. So as you would have seen in Falcon Flora and the, look, the last special general meeting and the various botanical society um, social media platforms, there has been a, a, a change in the, the way the memberships are run. Um, but if by tomorrow <laughs> you, 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 um, or, uh, you renew your membership, then you can still have that benefit of free access to the botanical gardens for another year and um, as a result of the the changing of the benefits there's been a significant decrease in the um, membership fees going forward and that'll help us um, in terms of focusing our energy on some of the plant conservation work that needs to be happening out in the landscape um, and uh, you know we have such an incredible community of people that um, uh, it's very much worth still being a, a member and being part of all the activities of the society. One of those activities, which is slightly broader than just the society, is the City Nature Challenge. So um, I put the link in the chat earlier, but um, at the end of April, we will be having um, the next city nature challenge and i just had a look at the southern african project there are more than 33 cities taking part in southern africa and as far north as kigali so that definitely keep an eye out on the social medias a lot of the bottom branches are participating and that'll be fun and our next webinar is actually really cool um we've now looked at gardening which is ultimately something quite personal because because it happens in your space but um we want to see how we can work on a more applied way of using indigenous plants and so this is definitely a way that we can um 
we 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 can uh, use our indigenous plants um, specifically within um, developments potentially as edible plants, and you're just gonna have to tune in to see what else is to be said. So thank you for joining us. Um, we really appreciate your time, and see you next year. Uh, not next year, sorry, next month <laughs> on the 20th of April. Look at the date, 20th of April. So because the last Thursday of the month is a public holiday, we're doing it a little bit earlier, and uh, which means I'll see you all a lot sooner than usual. So take care and uh, happy gardening. Goodbye.